Are you saying for the most part, more expensive shoes are gonna be better? Uh, it's, it's another, it depends. Cause like I said, there may be that super resilient person that just doesn't get hurt in anything. Not that the shoe is the main contributor to an injury, but you'd be safer and less risky, I would say, to be in like a more expensive pair of shoes. Now, when you get to like 120 versus 150 or 60, I don't think there's going to be any difference. Interesting. I've always wondered about that too, because I can justify spending 110, 120. But when it gets to the 150, 160 range, I'm like, I'm just going to buy another pair in a few months. So like what I could be saving 30 bucks and how much different really is this shoe other than being newer? I, exactly. Something that I, I always try to do, especially when I used to, where are they? When I used to wear Mizunos, I used to wear Wave Inspire, a stability shoe of. When they would come out with the next model, if I really liked the model that I was wearing, I would buy two pairs of that shoe because they would reduce the price. But I already knew that I loved wearing them and they're very comfortable for me. So I'd buy two pairs at $80 and then they'd release a pair at 120. I don't know. That was always a good tip of mine to just stock up on the shoe you like when the newer model's coming out. Yeah, definitely. And so many people get so frustrated when like a new model comes out because then it will be slightly different. And you know, they think the shoe company was out to get them and they like changed the shoe just because of that person. <laughs> um, which is kind of funny, but yeah, shoe companies, a lot of shoes are on like yearly updates to where, you know, every year a new one is coming out and they're trying to do something better. But then sometimes they will get something wrong that they had right the first time. And I can see how it makes some people frustrated, but that's why it's good to not just be married to one brand or one shoe. Try out different things. I like that. It change. And I have people that come in and are always like, yep, I wear Brooks, only Brooks. That's it. Don't want to look at anything else. And it's like, okay, well, the shoe, the Brooks you got on right there, that's from six years ago. It has changed so much since then. <laughs> um, and they're just still, eh, Brooks. Yeah, we it. are married to brands as runners. When I wore mm -hmm. Mizunos, I was like, Mizuno gang, that's it. I wear nothing else. But then I don't necessarily want trail Mizunos. I don't even know if Mizuno has trail shoes. But yeah, I'm not sure. I really need to branch out. And you're right. I think we sometimes get so obsessed with the brand and what we're wearing that we don't really think of, okay, what's the, actually the best option for me? Uh, the other day, we we get a lot of referrals from podiatrists and they'll send us a little slip. Uh, my podiatrist recommended I need a New Balance or a Hoka or an Asics or something like that. And then one day we had a podiatrist come in because sometimes they'll come in and get shoes from us. And then he was like holding up shoes and he's like, oh, now which model is this? Which model is this? Which one does this do? This is the support one. And in my head, I'm thinking, so you're giving these people advice on shoes, but you don't really even know what the shoe is or does yourself. There's a quote that I wrote down. This is from uh, Ross Tucker. He's a sports scientist from South Africa. Kind of a long quote, but goes with what we're saying here. So cool. he cool. says, the shoe has received a disproportionate amount and blame for injuries and performance. And on the injury side, the shoe is prescribed as if it's medicine. But when you think about medicines, you're thinking about drugs that have undergone randomized control trials over many years to test them. They know exactly what dosage, who should use it, when they should use it, how much they should use, and what the side effects are. It might be, but there's nothing like that for shoes. And that is so true. But so often, shoes are treated as like a medical device. But there's no studies showing that this shoe is going to prevent your pronation. But on top of that, pronation is not a bad thing in general. Dang. Okay. So general question to that then, how do you know if you're getting the right running shoe for you? Yeah. So like I said, that first kind of research paper came out linking like pronation to injuries, you know, 42 years ago. And after 42 years of research going through the minimalist movement to maximalist shoes, you know, and after hour long lectures, you can watch from biomechanists, you know, they'll always end with, it depends. Or go with what's comfortable is still what the science points to. You know, the shoe that's going to be, that feels the most comfortable on you is going to be the shoe that's going to be least likely to cause an injury. Shoes can be comfortable when you put them on, but is there a chance that they're going to be comfortable, they feel good, but then when you run, they don't feel good? Definitely a chance of that. You know, sometimes something will feel good, like in the running store, 
or when you first try it on and then you get out to a run and you're like, uh, oh, something is hurting or just doesn't feel good. Yeah. So I mean, sometimes it does take a time or two, just some trial and error to find what works for you. And then when you do find that, you know, I'd recommend trying to stick with it or something close to it. Got it. I mean, that makes sense. Let's go over some more general cues from our peeps, from our members, from the, um, mem. from the mems. So, oh, here's a really common question. Should you wear different shoes for different races or workouts? Yeah. So I wouldn't say you should, but you definitely can. And it's beneficial for me. I have like couple different shoes that I use and for an easy run I'll usually use like a kind of heavier shoe something a little bit more cushioned for uh like, like moderate the Hoka's that you had yeah and they're actually lighter weight too but so yeah for like longer runs or easier runs I usually wear like a Hoka and then for tempo runs I'll wear something that's a little bit lighter weight but still cushioned something like the Nike Zoom Fly for example or the Pegasus Turbo Enter Michelle. So something like this, you're saying for like a tempo workout? Yes. I mean, that's what I, I use. I have the turbo I mean, I love it just for like some slightly faster work. So like tempo work. And then when I'm doing even shorter stuff, like intervals, I'll drop to like a pure racing flat, not like the vapor fly or anything. I'll save that for race day. But yeah, so like, you know, starting at the top, basically the slower the run, the heavier the shoe I like. Okay. And then the faster the intervals or the tempo, I like to reduce the weight of the shoe. Just kind of a mental thing feels better. You know, you can just run a little bit faster with that reduced weight or that racing flat. Got it. So, so it's like, not all necessary to do it, but it could help you if you choose to do so. Exactly. It's definitely going to get you more comfortable at those faster paces. You're going to be able to run race pace a lot easier in a racing flat than you are in your normal training shoe. Got it. But for the majority of runs, probably wearing a more cushioned, that's your approach at least, more of a cushioned shoe. Correct. If, yeah. And like I said, that's my, that's my preference. You know, some people like something super firm. You know, I put people in a Hoka and they've taken two steps in it and they're just like, get this thing off me. Like this feels like a pillow underneath my foot and I hate it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. It totally depends. Just an example of what feels better for you, I guess. Exactly. How about, so different shoes for different terrain. I think we kind of covered this, but obviously the traction on the shoes, like trails versus road versus grass. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, if you're like doing like a trail race and it's a very technical terrain, I would definitely recommend getting a trail shoe. If it's not like super technical, you would be most likely fine in just like a normal training shoe unless it's like super muddy or something. Same thing if you're in the grass. That's what I've always done. I know some people, you know, think trail needs trail shoe and can definitely do that as well. But it's so individualized and, mm -hmm. you know, most of the time you'd be okay on a trail and just like a normal road shoe. Okay, that makes sense. I have these Nikes. They're my car, but they're like a hybrid. And I use them for trails around here, especially when they're not super technical because they have enough traction for uh you know the dirt when you're going downhill to like not slip but yeah. if the race were to transition onto the road it would be comfortable on my body i've noticed when i'm running on the road with traditional trail shoes they're so heavy for like yeah. classically or traditionally and they just feel weird and it's a lot of impact on my body so mm -hmm. like you can wear running shoes like classic road running shoes on trails but Doing it Not the other way could be a little sketch. I 100% agree. Just feels weird. Unnatural. Unnatch. Clunky. Clunk. How about treadmill versus outside? Different shoes for that? I, I wouldn't overthink that. I would just, you know, the shoes you run in on the road, I'd stick with them on the treadmill too. Okay. How about socks? Is there particular socks that you should be wearing? Socks can make a pretty big difference. Typically, you want to go with a sock that's like more non-cotton, so made of material, kind of like moisture-wicking clothing. A lot of it's like polyester, polyester nylon, something like that, just to uh, help wick away moisture. So your, you know, the sweat, water, whatever comes in your shoe or out of your feet, just so it doesn't cause blisters or unnecessary rubbing or anything like that. Just going to be a little bit more breathable. Mm -hmm. So I'll definitely recommend a non-cotton sock. So brands like Belega features, 
Swiftwick, CEP um, are just some of the ones I use. Wow. Whenever I buy expensive socks like that, I just lose them because those socks can be expensive. Are there any socks that are like a little bit more affordable? You're usually paying like $13, $15 for a per pair or more. And so but yeah, when they it will help you. you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, I think so. Investing in good socks is worth it. Yeah, I agree with that though. I mean, I'm like, it's expensive. Take all my money. <laughs> so, okay. Rotating your shoes. Does it make sense to rotate every day to allow the cushion to spring back? So I, I believe that was something else that kind of was developed as kind of a sales pitch to get someone to buy two pair of shoes. You know, I've never seen any research that that's going to last, make your shoes last longer. If you let the foam come back, like shoes don't have feelings. So I don't think that they're, yeah, I don't think that they're going to be like, okay, I needed a rest day today. <laughs> um, so I, like I said, there's no research saying that, you know, your, the foam does bounce back. Your shoes last longer if you're rotating them. I do think there's advantages to rotating shoes, you know, using two different types of shoes is going to, you know, make the muscles in your feet your leg work a little bit differently, which can be beneficial. Okay. But so benefits to that, but not going to make your shoe last longer. All right. That makes sense. What is the perfect age of a shoe for race day? Yeah, this is hard because I don't think there's a perfect age. I mean, I would definitely recommend getting a couple runs in or run in it for like two weeks or so before a race. But, you know, make sure... If you're running, if you're running like a 5k in it, you know, you're probably going to be fine if you just run a mile or two in it. But if you're running a marathon, I would definitely do a long run, you know, in the shoes you're going to be racing in at least once, not just put them on, walk around in them and that's it. Totally. Okay. That makes sense. When should you replace your shoes? Another good question. So I usually say 400 miles, give or take a hundred it can add up in price definitely you know if you're a bigger person you're they're gonna it's gonna be closer to that 300 mile mark they also break down a little faster in the summer just because the heat um but you know if you're kind of a smaller runner and you're just not super prone to injuries you can get closer to that 500 mark maybe even 600 you know there shouldn't be holes in it shouldn't be falling apart at that point but I would still say it'd probably be best to replace it, you know, five, 600 miles in. 600 definitely be in the upper limit of what most people would recommend. Got it. And then are there any cues that you can look for when your shoe is starting to mile out? Let's say if you weren't counting your mileage or kind of just forgot where you're at with that? Uh, I mean, just the normal visual cues of just like traction being worn down. I would say some people are pretty in tune with their body. It's like, oh, this is starting to hurt. So it's time to replace my shoes. These are exactly. pretty worn down. <laughs> yeah. And I've seen a lot worse too. Oh, yeah. I mean, usually in these Mizunos, at least, I would always know when I was getting kind of towards the 500 mile mark because I would get a little hole right here. It's time. It's time. It's time to get new shoes. Oh, I was going to say, I remember as a kid purposely, like after I had shoes for a while, rip a hole in them just so I could be like, oh, look, I need new shoes, mom, dad. Dang, you're smart. Huh. <laughs> And then, yeah, until they say, no, you're sticking with those. Then you just tore holes in your shoes and you got to wear them still. Okay, lacing. Is there a perfect way to lace your shoes? Should you lace your shoes differently if you have a wider forefoot, maybe a wide shoe in general? Are there just best practices to lacing? Another thing, definitely got to do what you prefer. I mean, there is hundreds of ways to like lace a shoe and like different combinations to do some of the two most common ones if you do have like a wider foot some people will like skip the first eyelets like closer to your toes just to like widen up that area so and then the uh, yeah and then the uh the runner's tie or runner's lock or heel lock is when you kind of it's impossible to explain without like a visual but it's at the top right yeah you go through the last hole just to like help secure your heel in so if people have more narrow heels or their shoes okay. slipping in the back Exactly. You just go through that and that should help snug up the heel a little bit more. I always tie my shoes like that when I run just because I like the shoe being as secure as possible. I'm like looking at what I do with all my running shoes. I guess I do that too for the most part, except for with the uh, the Mizunos for some reason. I think we really covered a lot of different bases and talked about things that I don't think a lot of runners really talk about that often. You know, it's taboo to talk about some of this stuff. 
because we <laughs> want to believe that we're getting the right shoe and really maybe there's a lot of right shoes for us. Maybe it's like you're saying trial and error. So if anyone has any more questions, definitely let us know in the comments because Larry will have the answer to it or one of us will. All right, let's go to best of. You know, guys, go get a pedicure. Uh, I have a hard time saying this, but it's like, you know, they got to make money. They are probably going to try to sell you a custom orthotic. You got a Rubik's Cube behind you? Oh my God, I bought one because, well, first of all, Matthew like got me into it. But then I was like, I, I really, it's like my bucket list. I really want to figure out how to do it. Oh, do you have one too? Do you know how? Yeah, he, I, like, he didn't talk to me about it, but he was like, you know, he's always like, oh, I can solve a Rubik's Cube in 30 seconds. So I was like, all right, I'm going to buy one. And I, I bought one like back in January and I was like, okay, this is a bucket list thing too. And I finally, like, after like a couple weeks, I was able to do it and like now I can it, I'm slow, but it takes me like two to three minutes to do it. Are you kidding me? 